Soon after Alexander the Great died in 323 BC, his empire descended into chaos as his generals, family members, and friends vied for control of his empire. When the dust finally settled, his empire had shattered into pieces. One man grabbed Macedonia and much of Greece. One took Turkey. One held control of Western Asia. And one, Ptolemy son of Lagos, seized control of Egypt and founded the Ptolemaic dynasty, which lasted for 300 years. He and his son, Ptolemy Philadelphus, were the true founders of the city of Alexandria. In fact, it's not always possible to separate what Ptolemy I did from what Ptolemy II did, so we have to keep them both in mind when talking about the founding of the city. Under their leadership, the famous museum and library of Alexandria were created, and the city would become the intellectual capital of the Hellenized world. The establishment of these institutions marked the beginning of a new age, and the next century would become the golden age of Greek science. Ptolemy may have been the political founder of Alexandria and its museum, but the intellectual tone of the museum was set by Strato, whom we might call the intellectual founder of the museum. Appropriately for this series, he was nicknamed Strato Hophysikos. Strato, the physicist. Alexander the Great had founded the city of Alexandria in the year 332 BC, in between various campaigns to conquer the world. So the ruling class there was of course Macedonian, like Alexander, while the majority were native Egyptians. But as the city grew in prosperity, it attracted people of every ethnicity from all over the empire. It became a bustling metropolis, sort of an ancient New York. So Alexandria was to become one of the great centers of Hellenistic culture. But what exactly does that mean, Hellenistic? Well, the Greeks called their homeland Hellas, and the territory that Alexander conquered was influenced by Greek culture. But it wasn't fully Greek. So we don't call it Hellenic. Instead, we call it Hellenistic, which you could maybe translate as Greek-ish. Ptolemy I was a childhood friend of Alexander and one of his leading generals. And like Alexander, he might have been tutored by Aristotle all those years back. And Aristotle's influence was to be seen all these miles away from Athens and for many years after his death through Ptolemy and his famous library and museum. But before Ptolemy could turn this city into the intellectual capital of the Hellenistic world, he would need to ensure his grip on power was solid. Ptolemy was a smart guy. He knew history, politics, and human nature. He was quite aware that the Egyptians had lived under Persian rule for a time, and had chafed under the humiliation of foreign rule. If he were to rule over the Egyptians, he would need to convince them that he was one of them. But how to do that while maintaining his stature in the eyes of the Greeks? He was resting his legitimacy on the notion that he was the successor to Alexander the Great, after all. The first step was a sort of cultural exchange between the Egyptian priests and Greek scholars. The Greek scholars gained access to centuries of Egyptian history and astronomical knowledge. The Egyptians provided Ptolemy with detailed information about how Egypt was run, and the priests became a bit Hellenized in the process making them more open to Greek rule. One high priest, called Manetho, was particularly helpful. Nowadays he's famous for his king list, 
that is, his chronology of the reigns of the pharaohs. But Ptolemy had another use for him. Together, Ptolemy, Manetho, and various Greek scholars came up with an almost unbelievable idea for unifying the Greeks and Egyptians so he could rule over them. They invented a new religion. To do this, Ptolemy melded the Egyptian god of the underworld, Osiris, with the bull deity, Apis, and called him Serapis. They gave him just enough god of the underworld characteristics to appeal to the Egyptians, but added a little Dionysian god of wine and parties to appeal to the Greeks, who weren't quite as obsessed with the afterlife as were the Egyptians. So Ptolemy carefully selected the features of his new god so that in the end, to the Greeks, he was just a Greek god ruling over a foreign land, and to the Egyptians, he was just a new manifestation of Egyptian age-old truths. And Ptolemy wanted to make sure that this new religion was far from the power of the Egyptian priests in Heliopolis, so he headquartered it, where else? In Alexandria. He built a new temple in Alexandria, calling it the Serapium, and commissioned the Greek master sculptor, Briaxis, to make a sculpture of Serapis, which he depicted as a bearded man like Zeus, not as a human-animal hybrid as the Egyptians would have done. This wasn't some half-baked attempt to control his subjects. Ptolemy really put a lot of thought into developing a religion that both Egyptians and Greeks would find alluring and persuasive. And because of that, despite what you might think, it worked. The cult of Serapis lasted for over 500 years, until 391 AD, when paganism was abolished inside the Roman Empire. But that's a long ways from here. Ptolemy's next step in making sure the Egyptians wouldn't reject his foreign rule of their country was to make himself pharaoh. Now, the real pharaohs were already ancient history by this time. The famous Ramses had died almost 900 years earlier. And the pyramids had been built well over 2,000 years earlier, for goodness sake. But this was the kind of greatness Ptolemy wanted to evoke. He began dressing as an Egyptian and attending traditional rituals. And finally, he announced that the days of foreign rule were over. Egypt would be reborn with himself as pharaoh. He would be known from now on as Ptolemy Soter, or Ptolemy the Savior. He also became known as Ptolemy I, because he was the first in a long line of Ptolemies, the beginning of a dynasty that lasted for three centuries. Ptolemy's son, Ptolemy II, took this Egyptian makeover one step further. Royal incest had been widely practiced by the pharaohs for religious reasons at the height of Egypt's power. Ptolemy II revived this tradition, marrying his full sister, Arsinoe. And although the Greeks might have been scandalized, the Egyptians rather approved. And for this, he earned the name Ptolemy Philadelphus, or sibling love. Now the first step in building a city is, well, building the city. Ptolemy called on Dinocrates of Rhodes, the most celebrated architect of his time, to plan the city. And he called upon Sostratus of Nidus to build the lighthouse. The famous lighthouse of Alexandria demands a little more attention here. It was built on an island named Pharos so the name Pharos became synonymous with the lighthouse. It stood over 100 meters high and was called one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It also became one of the symbols of Alexandrian prosperity. The other symbols were its famous museum and the library. Now Ptolemy ran his city of Alexandria for profit, but there's more to life than mere profit, and as the historian of science George Sarton put it, 
Ptolemy was Greek enough to realize that prosperity without art or science is worthless and contemptible. He wasn't out to run a charity, but he believed in the value of his Greek culture and wanted to establish it in Egypt. As soon as Ptolemy had finished consolidating the government of Egypt, he set out to found the famous Museum of Alexandria. Museum here doesn't mean what you think it means. Nowadays, a museum is a big building with a bunch of exhibits. Back then, a museum was a shrine to the muses, hence the word museum. The muses were spirits that inspire the creation of art and literature. There were nine of them, all daughters of Zeus. There was one for tragedy, erotic poetry, hymns, history, lyric poetry, comedy, music and dance, astronomy, and epic poetry. Out of that list, history and astronomy kind of stand out because we wouldn't really consider these humanities today. But if the Greeks want muses for them too, fine, I'll take it. But this museum was not just some kind of religious building. It was a royal institution that operated more like a modern research institution than anything else. It had dormitories for researchers and students, laboratories, astronomical instruments, botanical and zoological gardens, and a dissection room. You see, in much of the classical world, there was a taboo against studying the dead, but not in Egypt. There they had been preserving corpses through mummification for years. The process required detailed knowledge of the human body and the technical skills of dissection. Here at the museum, Herophilus of Chalcedon and Erisistratus of Chios used the opportunity to study the human body in detail, founding the sciences of anatomy and physiology. There were even rumors that they weren't content to dissect just dead bodies, so they obtained permission to dissect the bodies of live, condemned prisoners. The museum was a distant descendant and amplification of Aristotle's Lyceum. Alexander's empire crumbled after his death, but Aristotle's framework for studying science could not be so easily destroyed. Now across the sea, back in Athens, was a writer and politician by the name of Demetrius of Phalaron, who had attended Aristotle's Lyceum and later, in fact, had served as the ruler of Athens. During the political turmoil of the times, he was forced out and sought refuge in Alexandria. Ptolemy accepted him, and the two grew close. In fact, it's possible the museum was actually Demetrius' idea rather than Ptolemy's. In any event, like any great research institution, the museum needed a library, and Demetrius recommended to Ptolemy that he gather about him all the books on every subject he could find. And so the Great Library of Alexandria was founded, with Demetrius becoming its first director, forming the library around his own collection of books. Later on, Ptolemy III took the task of collecting books for the library to a new level. He tried to obtain a copy of every book in existence in the world. He ordered all travelers from abroad to surrender their books, and if the books weren't in the library, the originals were kept and a cheap copy was returned to the traveler. He also asked the librarian at Athens to lend him the state copies of the works of the famous playwrights Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides so he could make copies, leaving a fortune in gold as a deposit to guarantee their safe return. But in the end, he decided the originals were worth more than the gold and decided to keep them, returning the copies instead. Although the Library of Alexandria wasn't the only library in existence, nor was it the first, it was the largest of antiquity, and the most famous. Though it's hard to know its exact size, at its height it may have contained 400,000 scrolls. In the middle of the 3rd century BC, a catalog of the library's holdings itself filled 12 scrolls. Though, unfortunately, even the catalog has been lost. <laughs>
we know some names of some of the authors and some titles. In a few cases, we have full books. But the fate of the library and its books will have to wait for another day. Now back in Athens, after Aristotle had passed away, he had left his student, Theophrastus, in charge of his school, the Lyceum. He had also left him his large collection of books, his personal library. When Ptolemy's son, Ptolemy II, reached an appropriate age, Ptolemy I called upon Theophrastus to tutor the boy, just as Aristotle had tutored Alexander the Great and possibly Ptolemy himself. Theophrastus apparently liked his gig in Athens, though, and turned him down, and instead sent his most brilliant student, Strato of Lampsacos. Strato was born in Lampsacos, the same place Anaxagoras from season one spent his final years. All of Strato's works have been lost, so we don't know a lot about what he taught but we do know he was considered a physicist and an empiricist. That is, he relied on what you could actually observe about the universe. And in fact, we know he was able to correct Aristotle in at least one way. Aristotle taught that objects fall at a constant speed. Strato showed Aristotle was wrong by performing a little experiment. And what better place to show you this experiment than here? in front of Cleopatra's Needle in New York. You see, this obelisk was built in Heliopolis in Egypt around 1475 BC and was later moved to Alexandria by Augustus Caesar. And there it sat until 1881 when it was given by Egypt to the United States and put here in Central Park. In Strato's time, it hadn't yet made it to Alexandria but I figure this is probably the closest I'll ever get to Alexandria, so here we are. So anyway, Strato did something that you and I have probably done a million times without a thought. He poured some water from a container, and as he watched the water pour out, he noticed something curious. As the water pours out, it beads up. What piqued Strato's curiosity was that the beads of water seem to spread out as they fall. The beads near the top are closer together, but the beads near the bottom are farther apart. Let's rewind that and watch again. As the beads fall farther down, they spread apart. Why would that be? Here, let's picture this with little blue beads instead of water. Aristotle taught that everything falls at a constant speed. If we drop beads of the same size from the same height at some regular interval in time, we'd expect them to just keep marching downward like soldiers in a nice, regular, equally spaced line. But apparently, they don't. Strato realized that this was because the beads are not falling at a constant speed. His idea, which was correct, was that they're accelerating. As any one bead falls, it gets faster and faster. But since drop number one started falling first, it's moving faster than drop number two, which is in turn moving faster than drop number three. So they spread out. He also noticed that the impact of a falling body is a function not just of its weight, but its height. That is, if you drop the same rock from a higher height, its crater will be larger. <laughs> 
Again, he took this as evidence that objects accelerate as they fall. And of course, he was right about this. This is what I mean when I say that Aristotle and his followers used induction. They started from specific cases, like falling drops of water, and argued up to a more abstract idea, that all objects accelerate as they fall. I like this story because I think it's a good example of how physics really begins. Not with the grand, mysterious cosmic questions, but with small, knowable pieces. Everyone and their mother had been interested in the big cosmic questions and had written about them. But they never made any progress because they never rolled up their sleeves and worked on the smaller, knowable pieces first. The fact that objects accelerate as they fall is absolutely essential to understanding gravity and mechanics and how the universe really works. But Strato discovered it not by contemplating the primary substance of the universe or the ultimate fate of the cosmos, but simply by letting little beads of water fall from a spout and observing very, very closely. And do you remember Aristotle's idea of natural places? The idea is that each element moves in a straight line until it reaches its natural resting place. Strato denied this. He believed that all bodies have weight, which is a natural tendency toward the center of the universe. Light substances like air and fire move up simply because they are displaced, squeezed out by the heavier elements like water. And he also didn't believe in ether, Stars are made of fire in his version of events, and are subject to the same law of gravitation as everything else. I should say, Strato's version of the universe seems closer to the truth than Aristotle's, but since his works have been lost, we can't always say how he came up with them. Which is maddening because he apparently made extensive use of experiments. Now philosophers of the day weren't all keen on experimentation. I mean, if you're supposed to be studying the natural world to find out how the natural world works, why are you artificially manipulating things in an experiment? So apparently, Strato would pair his controlled experiments with naturally occurring processes, so critics couldn't say that he was artificially manipulating nature. Unfortunately, I can't give you much more detail than that, though. Strato wrote on logic, ethics, cosmology, meteorology, psychology, physiology, and zoology, and had a book of inventions. But his main interest was physics, in the sense of the study of the natural world, and this earned him the nickname Ho Physicos, which means the physicist. In his description of nature, he refused to acknowledge the reality of anything not subject to natural laws seen to apply to the terrestrial world. He required empirical evidence for everything, so much so that he's been called an atheist by later writers. Strato, perhaps more than any other person, was responsible for the museum's scientific bent. We might call him the true founder of the museum. He brought with him the intellectual atmosphere of Aristotle's Lyceum. It could have been all philosophy or literature or art, and those are all important things, but that's not what the Museum of Alexandria was. The museum was a scientific institution. Strato stayed in Alexandria for perhaps 12 years, until Theophrastus, the head of Aristotle's Lyceum, died, at which point Strato returned to Athens to become the new head of the Lyceum, where he stayed until his own death, 18 years later. The next century saw classical science reach its height, and the city of Alexandria was at the center of it all, with its library becoming synonymous with classical learning. Euclid, the author of the most influential textbook on mathematics ever written, flourished here. Eratosthenes, who measured the circumference of the Earth, did it here. Apollonius, who studied conic sections and developed the idea of epicycles, which would play an integral part in future models of planetary motion, worked here. Aristarchus, 
who measured the sizes and distances of the Sun and Moon, likely studied here under Strato. Timocharis, Aristolus, and Conan of Samos made their astronomical observations here. Not to mention Archimedes, who, though he flourished in Syracuse, likely studied here as well. The museum and library were made possible not just by the wealth and determination of Ptolemy, but by a cultural belief in the importance of learning. There's a story that's told about Euclid, the mathematician. Supposedly, he was teaching a student geometry, and after the first theorem, the student asked what he got out of studying such things. With irritation, Euclid turned to his slave and said, Here, give this man three coins since he needs to profit from what he learns. One might argue that societies that show this attitude, an attitude of disdain for those who care about knowledge or learning only if it makes them a profit, these societies are, ironically, precisely the ones that end up making the discoveries that enrich us all.